I am Sarah White, a retired director of pharmacy. And in this video, I have selected five excerpts that outline some major events in pharmacy's evolution, including the future of informatics from conversations with health system pharmacy's most influential leaders. To place them on a timeline, I'm providing the year each person graduated from pharmacy school. Your challenge is to build on these and many more landmark events to innovate the next steps for pharmacy services, always keeping in mind our patients. The first landmark event is the Hilton Head Conference that solidified clinical pharmacy as our direction. Max Ray, a 1962 graduate, was in 1985 on the ASHP staff and responsible for Hilton Head. In his full conversation, he describes his career journey, which has included being a director of pharmacy, faculty, chair of pharmacy practice, school of pharmacy dean, ASHP staff, and CEO of the California Society of Health System Pharmacists. Max's Whitney lecture is unique, Letters from the Edge. When you were with the ASHP staff, you set up what is referred to as the Hilton Head Conference. Could you talk a little bit about, I think that was roughly 1985. That's correct, yeah. What your thinking was, what it was, what process was used, and its significance. This was at a time when we were still discussing whether to move toward the PharmD program as the entry-level degree in pharmacy. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from a lot of uh, quarters on that, and we never got around to making that conversion until 15 years later. During this time, there was also pressure building to recognize clinical pharmacy as a specialty. I had been uh, at that time in the residency accreditation program at ASHP for 10 years. And as I had visited programs around the country, I began to see certain common elements in the way pharmacists were being trained in residency programs, which uh, concerned me and I expect they concerned others. The clinical role seemed to be to go on rounds, have physicians ask questions which you didn't know the answer to and you said, oh, I'll, I'll look it up and come back. Well, okay, and there's, that got us into the clinical arena, but it didn't seem to me that we were progressing very far, very fast. A big part of the profession was nowhere near that level yet, and uh, I don't mean to, uh, zero in on any particular area of practice, but uh, we, we really uh, had not developed any real meaningful clinical roles yet in, in community pharmacy where about 70% of our workforce uh, was going. The question, I guess, on my mind was, is pharmacy in 1985 uh, inherently clinical or is clinical pharmacy something unique to a few people that have a PharmD degree or, or some other advanced training. We put together a plan for a consensus conference. We, it was invitational, but efforts were made to uh, represent the leadership of the profession broadly, um, and not, not just uh, health system pharmacy, but the, the whole profession. We had educators, we had practitioners, we had association people. We had, uh, we had a couple of international uh, observers at the, at the conference. This was um, the meeting at which Doug Hepler gave his paper that became rather famous on uh, the covenantal relationship between pharmacists and, and society. That, that's not the precise title, but that's what he talked about. What came out of that conference was a resounding um, affirmative answer that yes, pharmacy is inherently clinical. And if we can't acknowledge that, then we are faced with the problem, okay, what, what is it? If, if clinical pharmacy is something special or is a specialty, then how do we define what's left? This was the first point at which thought leaders in the profession 
seemed to get their arms around this and agreed in the, in the report, in the proceedings, that uh, this is no longer on the table for discussion. We are going on record as saying that this profession that we spend our lives in and which we love is a clinical profession. And if, and, uh, uh, if we're, those who aren't there yet should aspire to get there. Now, we spent a lot of time at that meeting also discussing the barriers. What are, what are the things that hold us back, that are holding us back? What could we do to resolve those kinds of problems? And their proceedings really amounted to the keynote addresses and the results of these workshops where we looked at uh, barriers and, and uh, uh, potential remedies. What I wasn't expecting was the way that report resonated with the profession. Uh, and for some years thereafter, we kept hearing reference to the Hilton Head Conference. Now, many younger members of the profession probably don't have any idea about what this was, but uh, it, it came to be known simply as the Hilton Head Conference because it was held at Hilton Head Island uh, in South Carolina. It led to a series of follow-up meetings at state and regional levels, so the torch continued to be carried for, for some time. I remember that after I went to California, you mentioned earlier in the uh, interview that I had been the CEO for the California Society. One of the first things we did when I got there was to pick up on the Hilton Head uh, wave that was washing across the country. We had our own mini Hilton Head there in California. And the results of that conference drove the agenda for our state chapter for, for several years. Um, I think in my discussions with uh, one of my good friends in this profession, Dr. Doug Hepler, that this led directly to his thinking about pharmaceutical care as sort of the focus for pharmacy practice, he together with Linda Strand. Uh, I think Doug had thought deeply about all of this in developing his presentation for Hilton Head. It was only four years later that he gave the uh, uh, now famous pharmaceutical care presentation at, at the second uh, P21 conference. And so I believe that that conference had um, major influence on the way things have unfolded since then. Joseph Otis, a 1950 graduate, was the executive vice president and CEO of ASHP for 38 years. His complete conversation describes in detail the building of ASHP once it separated from APHA, lessons learned, and the development of the ASHP executive residency. Here he describes the founding of ASHP and the development and impact of practice standards. ASHP was formed in 1942. Mm -hmm. You took over in 1960, but as I've read of the 153 charter members of ASHP in, in 1942, 44% were women. Could you comment um, on women's involvement? Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't until 1978 that there was a woman president of ASHP. Right. Right. So comment a little bit about that okay. for us. Yeah. Well, women were involved in ASHP. <clears throat> uh, See, the structure of the board at that time uh, was not a totally elected board. The membership elected the president-elect, and the president-elect then appointed chairman of standing committees. And so uh, women would appear on the board by appointment, and it depended on who the president was uh, uh, as to what, and, and they were all male, of course, as you mentioned, until uh, the, the, the one uh, uh, fe first female. And, uh, but then the women usually were secretary or treasurer or some category like that. And it's interesting that uh, in the early days of the society, there were many religious uh, women who were members. And uh, that was at the time when you could tell what a religious, who was a religious because of the uh, dress that they had at the time, you know, and different uh, 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 orders and uh, all different uh, styles and so on. And it was always fascinating to me that more often than not, 
the treasurer of the society, with these few dollars we really had, happened to be a nun. And I always wondered why a nun always ended up being treasurer. Um, and I inherited one, Sister Bernice, who was treasurer for 12 years, I think. And I, I assumed that they took a vow of poverty. <laughs> and so the few dollars we had probably were safe in their hands. You know? <laughs> uh, over, uh, you know, it's interesting as I think about the involvement of women in that I was in high school in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And I remember very vividly being nominated for a student body president and declining it and saying uh -huh. it should be a man. Yeah. and how I've changed over my career, but society has changed. Right. So I think the, the key tip is women have always been very involved, and mm -hmm. it's been more recent in leadership positions, but leaders behind the scenes That's right. is sort of how I interpret that. That's right, and I, I can see that very clearly in my grandchildren, female grandchildren. Don't stand in my way, you know. Uh, <laughs> no encouragement there. They, they, they're out and running and full speed speed, yeah. The ASHP uh, original constitution was to develop a minimum standard, mm -hmm. which was done. Talk a little bit about the evolution of practice standards okay. within ASHP and their impact. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> yes, the minimum standard was the first one. And then along came a, a standard on internship training, I think is what we called it at the time. But while I was at the American Hospital Association, we had uh, a joint committee with the ASHP, uh, four members from each side. And I recall, uh, you know, I came out of practice where we were filling prescriptions and compounding and so on. At the end of the day, I knew exactly what I achieved. I went with AHA, and for the first month, at the end of the month, I went to my uh, boss and I said, you know, I, I'm ashamed to take my salary. I can't count anything that I achieved, you know. And, uh, and her advice to me was, give yourself a year. And that was good advice because what we were doing at AH, what you do at an organization is something that impacts over a lasting period. What we used to do as practitioners was something you could count every day. And uh, it became also a question, uh, uh, the uh, question I would get when we tried to hire uh, newer members uh, out of pharmacy who were clinically trained and say, am I going to lose my clinical skills? I'd have to admit, you are going to, you're not going to be as sharp on clinical skills if you come with us. But if you stay with us long enough, you'll see the outcome of your work that will not be a momentary thing, but it'll have a lasting thing. And this was the practice things, standards. practice standards. And, what, and I found when I was AHA that after I got that good advice from my boss, uh, by the end of that year, we had, we didn't call it a practice standard, but we had a statement on Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, uh, a statement on pharmaceutical services in small hospitals, a statement on the use of investigational drugs in hospitals, and we had the nucleus for the statement on formulary systems, which then also were in, uh, was endorsed by American Medical Association, American Pharmaceutical Association. Now I could see the measurement. Is it true, Joe, that when Medicare was enacted and then when Joint Commission revised its standards that they picked up and incorporated many of the practice standards that ASHP had developed? That's exactly right. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when uh, the Joint Commission used to issue a bulletin uh, periodically, and uh, on this one occasion, out of the, in the bulletin was a requirement that you had to have a pharmacy and therapeutics committee in the hospital based on the statement we had developed. And that was the beginning of that sort of thing, and the cooperation that exists between ASHP and, and Joint Commission uh, is, is wonderful, and, uh, and interest, in the interest of patient care, because uh, uh, all we're trying to do and what they're trying to do is uh, similar, you know, in different ways. Yeah. Mary Jo Riley, a 1959 graduate, talks about the value and functioning of professional organizations. As most of her career, she served on the SHP staff, being the chief operating officer. 
She describes how to handle major change as she moved the whole staff into a new building and why she never sought the top position. Having been on the ASHP staff for the majority of your career, in your view, what's the a purpose of a professional organization? I've always felt that the, a professional organization should do for its members those things that members can't do for themselves. And if you have that as the primary goal, many other things are enabled. The uh, advocacy that you do, members can't speak with any force. They're one person, but as an association representing 25, 30,000 people, when you approach uh, the industry or the legislators, doing publications, everybody needs this information, but everybody can't do it individually. Um, the formulary, for example, was uh, published by the society because individual hospitals had formularies, drug lists, but they couldn't all generate comparative and evaluative information about every drug. When we look at the various membership groups, they told us what they needed in one way or another. So we try to do, as a professional association, those things that members can't do for themselves. L let's talk a little bit about how a professional organization, specifically ASHP, has the members help with assessing the priorities and establishing the direction. Because the way in which ASHP does this is fairly typical of professional organizations. Maybe the place to start is by you describing the purpose of ASHP councils. Mm -hmm. ASHP, in order to do what members need to have done, have to have some way of collecting that information. We do it by traveling to individual hospitals traveling to uh, uh, chapter meetings, talking with members. But there are some formal ways that we do it as well. We have uh, ASHP, when I was there, there were five councils. I think those have been juggled and changed, but let's just say a, a generic council in uh, different subject areas, one in legal, one in professional, one in education, one in membership services. Those councils are made up of members who are appointed by the president, generally because an affiliated chapter has suggested them or board or officers have met them. But there are 10 people on a council, 10 members on a council. And toward my Later years at ASHP, we also had a student member, and now I think they might also have a resident uh, member. They try to get good geographic representation. So if you have five or six councils, you're involving 50, 60 members, maybe a few more. And those councils meet uh, at least once a year, sometimes more often. Sometimes they had telephone conference calls. Those councils meet and discuss what are the issues within their particular subject areas. And they make recommendations. Those recommendations go to the board. And there are some that the board says, yes, this is a good idea. Let's do it. There are some that require that a higher authority also look to see whether or not it's a high enough priority to devote society resources to it. And those then would go to our House of Delegates. And the House of Delegates is made up of members, apportioned according to ASHP membership within a state. So a small state might have just two delegates, a larger one, 
I don't know how many California had, uh, 10 maybe. And those same issues that had bubbled up through the councils would go to the House of Delegates and the House would debate them and say yes, no, or maybe. Sometimes they sent them back for more study. From the staff perspective, after each of those council meetings and after the House meetings, we had a list of all the things that had come out of the councils. Mm -hmm. And that list was quite extensive sometimes, might be 50 or 60 things on there that needed to be addressed in one way or another. And there was a staff group called then the Policy Implementation Group. We would meet and look at every one of those recommendations and say, how can we address this? Do we need to refer it to publications? Do we need to go up on Capitol Hill and, and storm the halls of Congress? What do we need to respond to this need that has been identified? Mm -hmm. And that policy implementation group met four or five times a year so that you didn't just get it on your plate and leave it there. You had to report back uh, uh, to the, the status of it within a reasonable period of time. John Gans, a 1966 graduate who as APHA CEO describes how his organization is the only non-governmental building on the Washington Mall. John traces his career evolution from clinical practice, faculty, ASHP president, dean, to leading APHA in his conversation. Tell us a little bit about uh, the I guess, redeveloped building, APHA's building. Where are we located in Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. And you recently have sort of redeveloped that headquarters. Tell us a little bit about that, because that's pretty significant, I think. Yeah, uh, wow. Um, that's another issue that when I went there, um, uh, you have this beautiful location. And when you stand on the front steps of APHA, you are looking at the Lincoln Memorial, and you are looking at the Vietnam Memorial. And there's nothing between you and them <laughs> except the street that runs down. And um, we got this unique location. Um, I'm not exactly sure the whole story, but uh, the uh, third or fourth president of, um, of, um, of APHA was a prominent Washington pharmacist. And he owned, uh, his name was Kidwell, and he owned Kidwell's Meadows. And Kidwell's Meadows was part of the Potomac River, sort of marshland. And the, the Potomac is somewhat tidal. Um, and um, that was right at the end of what was becoming the National Mall. Now, this is way, way back. And um, they wanted to uh, build the Lincoln Memorial or whatever. And they did some kind of a swap or whatever. And, and, and so where the Lincoln Memorial is, is on Kidwell's Meadows. They filled it in and built the Lincoln Memorial. And here's this beautiful building. Uh, and to draw a picture for, for people, um, the, there's Arlington Cemetery up on the hills of Virginia across the river, from the Potomac River. And then there's this road that runs right out of Arlington, right across what's called Memorial Bridge. And if people remember uh, any kind of state funeral or anything like that, that's the bridge that runs. Right. And at the, at the, on the Washington side of that, it's anchored by the Lincoln Memorial. And that starts the National Mall and runs up where Martin Luther King gave his speech, reflecting pond, uh, the Washington Monuments in the center, and then the Capitol is at the other end. And so APHA is the only non-governmental building actually on the mall. And uh, so we had this wonderful location, we had space, we owned it, but the building was way, way underdeveloped by today's standards. So. Um, we started thinking about selling it and nobody wanted to do that because it was so unique. Well, could you develop it and could it be a source of non-dues revenue for the organization? And that's what we set out to do and we built, uh, we built a, a six stories up, two parking down and then another level below that. So it's about a 10 story, a huge building on top of that. And we leased most of it to the federal government and uh, so we were able to renovate the front building, which was a national monument, and, and it was designed by uh, John Russell Pope, uh, who was called the uh, architect to the empire. 
and he did several prominent buildings in Washington and then many around the world. And um, we built a new building, and um, it was kind of the last uh, last thing that I uh, that I uh, uh, was there for as the CEO. And we uh, moved back into it, and it's um, spectacular. The views from the sixth floor where our offices are, you can see from the Supreme Court all the way to Arlington Cemetery, and it's beautiful. And um, it's quite a legacy for um, the organization and for the profession. So this is you know, just one of those things. We did it predominantly to, uh, to increase our presence, no question, okay, mm -hmm. make a statement on the mall. Mm -hmm. This is the pharmacist building. Um, but also it was good business. So it gets back to that other half of that equation. When you're an executive of an organization, it may be nonprofit, but it, no money, no mission, as someone once said, and you've got to have the resources to represent the profession. The final excerpt is from Dennis Tribble, a 1971 graduate who has specialized in informatics. Find in Dennis's complete conversation his career from practice, informatics, to working for the industry. Here he describes what he thinks the future will be. This kind of leads into my next question about what changes do you think will happen in informatics and technology over the next five to ten years that are going to affect pharmacy practice? The, the things that I really hope will happen at this point, because I'm still seeing us struggling with some of these issues, is that we will get past the growth curve of getting people on online medical records. And, when we, and we will begin to actually leverage the promise that those databases of patient data provide. And that suggests that there's a need for a group of tools out there that are probably now only in their infancy uh, that help us digest this massive amount of information and bring to our attention those things that require our attention and input. A uh, good friend of mine, in fact, the fellow who started Health Data Sciences, Ralph Cortman, used to talk about uh, the, the uh, complementary features of a computer system and a human. Because a computer system can, up, can doggedly apply and rigidly apply a set of rules over a massive amount of data and never get tired and never make a perceptual error, right? Barcode scanners never misread a barcode, almost never. Right? Human beings have known error rates. Uh, in fact, there's a, 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 a surprisingly robust amount of information coming out of the nuclear power regulatory in, uh, industry and oil rigs, of all places, that talk about the propensity of an intelligent human being to make a mistake. And at the end of the day, an error rate of roughly 3%, so three out of 100 transactions, is considered normal for an intelligent human being. And when you put that individual under pressure, that rate can raise as high as 25%. So what, when we look at, at the notion that, that we as human beings have, um, have perceptual failures, we get tired, we develop uh, confirmation bias. We do all sorts of those things. Uh, expecting ourselves to do this kind of work is really, really uh, foolish. And in point of fact, we are probably now at the point in our professional practice where the sheer volume and acuity of work we're doing is so high that it is beyond the capacity of human diligence. So what we really need to be doing is focusing that perceptual energy on the cases that need our attention. Alan Flynn did a, uh, 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 an op-ed piece on what he called Newport, Nearly Universal Pharmacist Order Entry, and he raised the question that by looking at every order, were we somehow missing the opportunity to really spend our energy on, on the orders that need our, our process? And uh, so the, the role of the computer should be to digest all that mostly normal information and find the needles in that informatics haystack that really deserve our attention. And then the role of the human is to do the things humans do that computers can't do, which is the ability to make intuitive leaps based on incomplete information, 
to develop a set of direction where you know a, an intense anal analysis of all the available data would probably leave you confused, right? Uh, Dr. Cartman used to refer to the notion that as a hematologist, he'd walk into a hospital room and he'd look at the patient and he'd go liver cancer and then spend the next three days proving that he was right or wrong. But there's this gestalt process that we've never been able to computerize and are likely, uh, unlikely to be able to do so. So the best match of the tool to the person is to create a process where the tool finds all the things I should be looking at, presents them to me and then lets me apply my unique skills to focusing on those. And, and that, I think, is the next real horizon. Uh, the current computerized decision support systems focus, focus fo excuse me, let me try that again. The current compu uh, computerized decision support systems focus mostly on order entry. Uh, but a significant chunk of what needs to be focused on are the downstream impacts of what appears to be a benign order. And so we're talking now about products, and there are a few now on the market that actually are starting to do this, that actually watch patients over time who might be at risk right, and come back and say, you might want to go follow up on that guy because he's been on Coumadin for four days and there's no INR in the chart, right? And those kinds of things. Um, there's starting to be now some what are called inference engines at which you can literally throw a database with no guidance at all. And the inference engine will actually go through and come up and tell you about all of the data relationships that it finds. And some of them are, yeah, okay, fine, that's right. You never have uh, oophorectomies in a male patient, right? But then there are others that turn out to be, oh my God, I never saw that value. I never saw that association. And I think that's the next big thing. Uh, the, just this notion of something that's constantly watching this on a population basis and is noticing relationships that we should at least investigate. They may not turn out to be real. They may turn out to have an or undisclosed cause. But we need to look at them. And right now, we don't even know that we need to look at them. And we don't have the mental capacity to, to find them without computerized assistance.